Hey guys, my name is Stephen Lowe, and I'm the author of Overcoming Gravity, this book here, which we'll be going through um, Fundamental Knowledge Base Part 1, and Chapter 1 is what we'll be going through, and uh, we're going to cover progressive overload, leverage, common training concepts, and the repetition continuum. So let's get started. So Franklin Henry was the one who invented or slash discovered the said principle and what the said principle is is specific adaptation to impose demand or implied demand and it was invented for motor learning um, but we can understand it in terms of resistance training in that whatever forces you apply on the body it's going to adapt to um, so for resistance training um, barbells or body weight in particular when you work the muscles all of the other surrounding tissues also adapt as well. So um, for example, uh, with our muscles here and here, if you're doing a bicep curl, not just the bicep is getting stronger, all the tendons connected to the bicep, as well as the joints like the elbow and the shoulder, um, all of the ligaments and cartilage and blood vessels, they're all getting stronger because there is a imposed demand of resistance on those specific um, tish, muscle tissues. Um, so the way in which we get a body to continuously and progressively get stronger and bigger and adapt is the concept of progressive overload, uh, which Thomas DeLorme, uh, one of the first physical therapists who was working with patients uh, during World War II, um, he came up with that concept, and basically, progressive overload is increasing the uh, forces on the muscles or otherwise injured tissues over time, allowing them to adapt. So, for example, if you're bicep curling 10 pounds, um, just sticking at that weight won't make your biceps bigger and stronger over time. You're naturally going to have to increase the weight from you know, 10 pounds to 15 pounds to 20 pounds, etc. over time. Um, for body weight exercises, that is mainly making the exercises more difficult over time. Um, for example, uh, with barbells and body weight, usually, you, or barbells and dumbbells, you usually want to add weight uh, to make the exercises harder. However, with body weight exercises, usually you will aim at changing the shape of the exercise or um, progressively adding weight to it, like through a weighted vest. Um, you can also make the next progression easier, uh, such as using bands or a pulley system. Um, and or um, some other ways are to uh, use longer ranges of uh, length of the muscle or shorter ranges. And I'll get to that on the next slide. So leverage is the concept um, that uh, basically um, a seesaw is one example of leverage, and so when you put weight on one side of the seesaw, it causes the other side to go up, and then if the other person pushes up with their legs, usually that decreases their weight on this side, which allows the other side to go down. Um, that is one example of leverage. Um, with our bodies, uh, the planche, as seen below in the tuck planche, straddle planche, and full planche images are another example of leverage. And that is the forces applied to the shoulder uh, for the planche in particular. So with the tuck, the center of mass of the body is pretty close to the ribs or in between the belly button and the ribs. Um, with the straddle, it's more towards the belly button. And then with the full planche, it's, the center of mass is more towards the hips. And so since the muscles of the shoulder are the primary movers, um, you can see that as the center of mass gets further and further away from the uh, fulcrum of the shoulder, it requires more and more force to be put on the muscles of the shoulder to get stronger to do the specific movements. And so basic physics um, is uh, the torque at the shoulder is the force. Um, so gravity pulling on your center of mass is your force times the distance. So as the distance increases, the torque will increase as well. And so that is the reason why changing the body shape is able to create more and more forces at the shoulder joints or whatever muscles you're working at 
um, in order for you to get stronger. So it's also the case that working muscles at the end ranges is uh, another way to get stronger. And an example of this is such as your like L sit and then versus your V sit versus your mana. So with the L sit, uh, the abs and hip flexors are basically um, in a shortened range of motion. But as you go to a V sit where you're more compressed and your knees are closer to your face, um, obviously that requires more force from the abs. Um, similarly with exercises like um, the iron cross where your arms are straight up to the side that puts the muscles of your pecs and your lats on more length which makes the exercise harder. Um, one example of this that is easy to understand is bicep curls. Um, naturally uh, with a bicep curl um, your muscle is strongest at the middle of its range of motion so about 90 degrees um, however with a fully strained arm the muscle bicep muscle is on length versus a very um, compressed arm up like this it's at a very short length and so usually the muscle ranges at the longest and the shortest tend to have the least contractile overlap between the, the myosin and actin proteins which means that um, it's going to be harder at those specific ranges. And so we can manipulate the exercises to have the muscles at longer or shorter ranges in order to make an exercise more difficult. Um, so I can't assume that all of you listening to the series are very knowledgeable on exercise. And so um, that's why I want to briefly go over the common training concepts. Um, so the first one is repetitions. So 10 push-ups is basically 10 repetitions of a push-up. Um, sets are usually um, comprised of repetitions and then you rest and then you do another set. So if you did, did 10 push-ups, that's one set. Then you rested, say, three minutes and then you went to 10 push-ups again. That's a, a second set. Um, the rest is the period between the sets that allow you to recover. And so for strength and hypertrophy, usually it's about three plus minutes that you wanna rest between sets so as not to um, allow your nervous system to recover and also allow your muscles to recover to a point that's not getting limited by the energy in your muscles and that you'll get full quality of your sets. Um, the tempo of an exercise is uh, basically the different time periods in which you do the exercise. So for example, with a push-up, if you, um, the first number is a one, uh, the second zero number is a zero, the third number is an X in this case, and uh, the fourth number is a zero. And with the push-up, this would be a one second eccentric. So starting from the top of the push-up and going down to the bottom of it, and then zero second pause at the bottom, and the X for tempo means you're going to push up as quickly as possible in as in an accelerating concentric motion or muscle shortening, which is what concentric is, and then zero second rest at the top. So that's standard tempo, one, zero, X, zero, four different numbers for uh, the speed in which the repetition varies, um, pausing at the top, pausing at the bottom, and then the muscle lengthening and muscle shortening uh, aspects of the exercise. For pull-ups um, and pulling exercises, it's in reverse. So usually you start at the bottom in a hang with your pull-ups and you first do the concentric phase, which is the X. So you pull up with the X, rest zero seconds at the top, then slowly lower for the eccentric and then rest zero seconds at the bottom. So it, it'll go zero X, zero, one, zero for uh, pull-ups. And uh, basically it, goes with the same uh, for push-ups with starting with the uh, eccentric, but uh, with pull-ups, it's a little bit opposite, but the tempo is still written standardly uh, with the eccentric component first. Um, so the intensity and load is how difficult an exercise is, and it's usually expressed as a one rep max. Um, for example, with barbell exercises, if you could bench press 100 pounds, that is your one rep maximum. So if you're working at uh, 80 pounds, that is 80% of your one rep max. Um, and uh, for body weight exercise in particular, uh, we don't necessarily go by the load, but we do understand it in terms of um, percentage of one rep max generally corresponds to a certain amount of reps. 
Um, so there's tables out there where um, approximately 90% of your one rep max is about three to four reps. 85% um, is about um, six to eight reps or so. Um, basically, it, it varies a little bit, but generally, um, when you specify a certain percentage of your one rep max, there is a certain amount of reps that usually corresponds to that particular uh, percentage. Um, so volume is generally the amount of total sets done, and this generally corresponds to um, how many sets you're doing on the muscle groups. So for example, um, for pulling exercises such as pull-ups and rows, um, both pulling exercises of pull-ups and rows use the biceps, the chest, the lats as primary movers. And so uh, the volume done on a particular set of muscle groups like the pulling muscles is usually corresponds to uh, all of the pulling exercises you've done. So the intensity of the load Intensity and load is sometimes uh, a bit confused uh, with volume and how that relates to work capacity. Um, I'll discuss that on the next slide. Um, generally, frequency is how many workouts you do per week. So um, a common schedule for beginners is three times a week full body workouts. And so uh, the frequency is three times a week with the various exercises. So an attribute is basically a particular quality that is being trained. Um, some of the common ones that we're going to be working with are obviously strength um, and hypertrophy. Some people are working for endurance or cardiovascular fitness or power uh, or uh, other attributes like those, flexibility and so on. And all these different traits can be trained um, a certain amounts, um, some more often than others. And we'll get to that further. Um, failure is basically the point at which you cannot form a, another repetition, and technical failure is when you cannot form another repetition in good form. Um, so generally, uh, with strength training and hypertrophy training, you want to be training about within about three to four reps in reserve, so that's RIR, um, to about close to failure, depending on the uh, aggressive overload method that you're using and how close you are to the end of your cycle. Um, so work capacity is sometimes confused with intensity and volume. And basically work capacity is your ability to perform exercises um, in a particular workout, and it will increase over time. And so uh, work capacity is generally um, explained in terms of the volume of sets times the intensity of, of exercises. Um, so as a beginner, usually your work capacity and optimal volume range is about four to six sets per muscle group. But as you get to train beginner and intermediate, that generally goes up from about the four to six range to about six to eight. And then from about six to 10 uh, total sets that is optimal to uh, progress with your exercises over time. Uh, deloads are basically a planned period in order to reduce or remove uh, exercises um, either in frequency, volume, or intensity from a routine in order to recover better and um, get rid of any excess fatigue and allow the fitness that you gain from working out to uh, express itself. And so um, this leads to a super compensation effect, which um, shows your fitness. Um, you basically get stronger as the fatigue goes down. And finally, the last common training concept is a plateau. And basically, that's when a specific workout routine has stopped providing um, measurable improvements. This can happen for a lot of specific reasons. Um, like I've stated before, fatigue can be an issue. Um, outside factors such as poor sleep, um, poor nutrition, excessive stress can be issues. Um, it can also be the case that you're just doing too much in a routine as well. Um, so there's a lot of different factors that go into uh, plateaus, and we'll analyze that as we get further into the series.